Well, as I begin, I would like for the Sturdivants and each of them, and Katie's mom, to stand up, if you would. Darlene, you guys stand up. All right. And you're, you got any other kids around here? Yep, stand them up. Any others? All right. I just want you to know, okay. I want you to see them. I hadn't necessarily in my mind planned this for a living illustration, but by the time I'm done, you will understand how this is significant to the message I have to deliver today. You can be seated. I uh, met uh, Darlene and her family about 30 years ago. It was at the passing of her husband. I had the funeral service for that, and uh, we started a relationship from that day forward that uh, ended up in a wedding with Jeff and Katie right here in this place. And uh, I guess they just saw a video uh, just recently, and uh, Katie looked the same. Jeff has changed, and my hair has fallen out and turned colors, and the church has changed a little bit and all kinds of things. But uh, anyway, you'll see the significance of that here in a minute. Um, or hopefully in a minute here or two. But I just want to share with you, I, I really feel like today, I feel like in the scripture it says in the sec second, you're going to have a hard time following me with scriptures. So you can just write down references because I, I'll just do what I'm going to do. Um, but in 2 Kings chapter 7, the city was surrounded by the Syrian army. And starvation inside the city was horrendous. It was so bad that they even resorted to cannibalism. Two ladies got in a dispute about whose baby they were going to eat the next day. I mean, that's how horrible it was. And it, it got so bad that they sold a donkey's head for two pounds of silver. And you could buy the dung from a dove for two ounces. Now, a dove's just a little bird. But you can begin to see the starvation going on inside the city was horrible because the army outside was there to kill them. Well, there were four lepers. And the four lepers who were outside the city, they determined, they said, well, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go and surrender ourselves to the army, to the enemy, they might kill us, and then we'll die. But then again, they might actually have mercy on us and feed us. So they determined, what do we got to lose? So they went into the enemy camp. And when they got to the enemy camp, the enemy was gone. They had fled. They'd fled. They'd left all their garments. They'd left their food. They'd left their silver. They'd left their clothes. They left, they left everything. They just up and fled because the scripture says that they had heard a noise and they thought it was an army coming after them and they were terrified and they got up and they, they all fled. And so here these four lepers are in the land of the massive army and they've got all of the food. They must have been on a cruise. Any of you ever go on a cruise? I've never been on one, but I hear they have all kinds of food. Once I'm full, I'm full. I don't know if that's good for me, but, but there's, on, there's all this food. So they fed, they ate, they were, ah, oh, and then they could close and, oh, wow, this is good. They got all these things. And so they went and they thought, well, we're going to hide this stuff. And then they went to the next tent. And then their conscience started to bother them a little bit. They said, you know, why is it that we are benefiting from all of this stuff? But yet there are people back in the city who are starving to death. It is not right that we should have this and not tell them. So they went back to the city and they told the people what they had found. Long story short, the people came out and they were blessed. They had the food. And in some respects, I feel a little bit like those four lepers. In this respect, that the Lord has revealed something to me that, that is so good. I thought, I cannot hold on to this. I really need to share this with others. I have served as a pastor, as I said, for 37 years at the Bible-believing Baptist Church in Gray. And I've just recently stepped down as a pastor, and I stepped down, or retired, whatever you want to call it. I stepped down that I might give myself full time to Compassion's Calling, a ministry, Compassion's Calling. 
And let me give you a very practical definition of compassion. It may not be the theological definition, but it's one that works for me. Compassion is having your hurt in my heart. Compassion is having your hurt in my heart. And real compassion compels people to do things. Compassion isn't something you just sit back and say, oh, I care. But compassion actually compels you to do something. When Jesus saw the multitudes who were hungry, it says that he was moved with compassion. And what did he do? He fed them. Compassion does something. It compels action. So when you have the story of the, the, the account of the Samaritan who came by and there was a person there and the priest came by and he saw him and I can vision my mind and said, God bless you. Hey, God bless you. I care. You know? And the Levite goes by and says, oh, God bless you. God bless you. I care. And they go on by. But the Samaritan came by and he reached out to him. He took him. He did something. He had real compassion. Compassion compels us to do something. And when it comes to this calling, compassion's calling, compassion calling is honoring those who have passed, but helping those who are left behind. And compassion's calling is for you, it is for me, it is for all of God's children, it is for the young, it is for the old. This is a ministry that we can do, we're called to do it, and everyone can do it. We have the ample opportunity to do it, to come alongside, to help hurting people to do it, and God has provided for us the tools whereby we may be actually able to do just exactly that. Compassion's calling. And I share with you, we are admonished in the Scripture. God's Word admonishes us to be involved in compassion's calling. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 40 and verse 1, it says there, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. It's a command. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And what do you do? You comfort people who are hurting. Comfort people. And then in the book of Luke in chapter 6 and verse 36, it says that we are to be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. We are to be compassionate just like our Heavenly Father. In the book of Ephesians in chapter 5 and verse 1, it said we're to be imitators of God as dear children. We need to be compassionate as God is compassionate. We have the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In the book of Matthew in chapter 9 and verse 36, it says that the Lord had saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion before he saw that they were faint and they were scattered as sheep that had no shepherd. He saw them and he was moved with compassion. In the Gospel of John in chapter 11 verse 35, most of us know this great big long verse in the Bible. It's summed up in two words. Jesus wept. What? It was at the uh, burial of, of Lazarus. He wept. And we are admonished in the Scripture in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15. It says, we are to weep with those that weep. In the book of Isaiah, we ask ourselves, how do we do this? It says, Isaiah 61 and verse 1. It says, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me that I might preach good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted. Does anybody ever know anybody has got a broken heart? Anybody here ever have somebody close to them pass away? Anybody just raise your hand? Did that ever break the hearts? It certainly breaks the heart. There's a lot of broken hearts. A lot of broken hearts about a lot of things. There's broken hearts about the passing of a loved one. There's broken hearts over a rebellious child. There's broken hearts over the loss of a job. There's broken hearts because of a health. And we are called to come alongside to those to give good news and to bind up the broken heart. That's what it says. Then in the scripture in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1 and verse 3 and verse 4, it says, comfort others whereby with the same comfort we are comforted. When you walk through the valley yourself and you've experienced those things, then you found that comfort that comes to you with the same comfort that you receive. Pass that on to somebody else. Comfort others with that same comfort. In the book of Jude, in verse 22, Jude in verse 22, it says this, some having compassion making the difference. What is the difference? Compassion makes the difference. I read a quote that says, God uses broken people like you and me to rescue broken people like you and me. This key is compassion that opens up a lot of doors. 
I have here a key. This key is the key to my post office box. Most of you have a key similar to that if you have a post office box. And I put that key in there and open it up. And when I put that key in and open it up, I get all kinds of stuff that comes through that. Well, one of the keys that God has given to us is compassion. And when we follow compassion's calling, we'll find that this door unlocks a door that opens up the avenue whereby we might fulfill the great commission that God has given to each one of us. A job for each one of us to do. And it's something that he has provided for us. We can do this. Now, I gave you some scriptures that admonishes us, admonishes us to be involved in compassion's calling. We have a scripture admonition. But one of the saddest verses of Scripture I have found in the Bible is found in, found in Psalm 142, and it's verse 4. It's a sad verse. It's sad we hear it too many times. It says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. That's sad. No man cared for my soul. What a sad scripture. No one cared. I remember very distinctly something that happened. I was in the army. I came home from the military. My, my grandfather had died in the month of March. I came back about three or four months later, and I wasn't able to be there at the funeral service for my grandfather. I wasn't able to be there for my grandmother. And when I saw my grandmother, my grandmother Slifer said to me, she says, when I needed people the most, they weren't there. And I looked at my grandmother like, what? I know our family. That doesn't make any sense. When you needed people the most, they weren't there? She says, yes. When I needed people the most, they weren't there. Because after the funeral was over, everybody went their way, and I went home alone. And I never forgot what she had said. I shared the message that I'm going to be sharing here with you at a church in Illinois. And after I finished the message, a lady came up as though I hit a red hot button. She came up to me and she was, she was filled with a sense of rage and anger. She said, I've been in this church all my life. And my husband died 21 years ago. And this church has absolutely failed me when it came to this area. Also, I spoke in a different church. I had a mother of three come up to me, and she said, when I was 15 years old, my mother died. And there was absolutely no one there for me. And as a result of it, I became bitter and angry with God, and I drifted away from God, and it took years for me to ever come back to the Lord. But she had come back. And I thought about that. And I thought that, and I explained to him, it's, it's, it's not that people didn't care. It's a fact that people just don't know how to care. You see, here's how people tend to respond on the negative side of the passing of a loved one. One of the things is they avoid the griever. I spoke in uh, Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. And the lady, after I spoke to the leadership, the leadership team there, the deacons, the elders, and the whole group of them, this lady came up, and she had tears literally streaming down her face. And she says to me, she says to me, she says, she says, you know, my very best friend, this is just this last year, my very best friend, husband died in Vietnam. You know when Vietnam was? Many of us do. My husband's very, husband died in Vietnam. My very best friend. And she says, after that, I never spoke to her again. And she said, I realized today how wrong I was. People will avoid the griever. Another thing people will do is they avoid ever mentioning the name of the person who is deceased. I don't want to say John's name because if I say John's name, that's going to bring back John. She's going to be sad. She's going to cry. She will, no. So they will avoid ever mentioning the name of the person who's deceased. And the person who has lost somebody really does usually want to talk about the person who is deceased. I'll tell more about that. And then there's also the case where we just, 
well meaningly we say stupid things. Did any of you ever hear anybody say stupid things? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I spoke. I say stupid things all the time, but <laughs> that's another way. Sorry. But uh, I spoke at, a, at, at this message here, and one pastor came up to me, and he told me, he says, you know, we're talking about saying stupid things. He said, I was at a funeral, and a person's child had died. I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said to him, and says, I understand. And he looked at me. And he says, oh, you've lost a child? He says, no, I never have. Then he says, you don't understand. I talked to a lady whose husband died 11 years ago, and this is what she had said in response. She says, I recall many would ask, how are you? Though well-meaning, I wanted to say, how do you think I am? I just lost my husband. And she said, she went ahead and shared some other things. And she said after that, that was 11 years ago. And then she closed by saying, I could feel myself getting those same feelings again when telling you about that happened. It was on Larry King. Many of you remember the lady whose husband died in 9-11 who was on the plane. One of the people who had rushed uh, the terrorist people there. And, and Larry King says to the wife, he says, oh, you're still young and you're pretty. You can get married again. Wow. I mean, really, we, we do say some pretty stupid things. Um, I've got an article in here about a sister. Um, she said this. Well, uh, yeah. Her sister died. It's right here. And she says this. I'm, I'm going to read this. And please be patient with me. I'm long-winded. So... She said this, she said, I love Jesus. I love God. I love his truth and I love his people. But I don't love packaged Christian answers. Those that tie everything up in a nice, neat bow and make life a little too tidy. I don't care for the simple Christian statement. Because there was just anything, there just isn't anything tidy about some things that happen in our broken world. The senseless acts of violence we hear about continually in the news are awful and sad and so incredibly evil. And God help me if I think I'm going to make things better by thinking up a clever Christian saying to add to all the dialogue. God certainly doesn't need people like me with limited perspectives, limited understanding, and limited death trying to make sense of things that don't make sense. Is there a place for God's truth in all this? Absolutely. But we just, we must, must, must let God direct us in his time, in his way, in his love. And when things are awful, we should just say this is awful. When things don't make sense, we can't shy away from simply saying this doesn't make sense because there's a difference between a wrong word at the wrong time and a right word at the right time. He said, when my sister died, horrible, tragic death, he said, uh, it infuriated my raw soul when people tried to sweep up the shattered pieces of my life by saying things like, well, God just needed another angel in heaven. And she went ahead and talked about her emotions, her feelings, and all of those kind of things. That we just say some really stupid things. Now, we don't mean to say stupid things, and I suppose all of us are, are guilty at times of doing just exactly that. So, what I see here, we have a scripture admonition uh, to care. We see the sad analogy is that no one cares. The reality is that it's not that they don't care, they just don't know how to care. And then there's this reality is missed opportunities. And this is where I'm at. Missed opportunities to care. In the scripture it says in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9, there's a great and effectual door that has been opened unto me. But there are many adversaries. There's great opportunity. In the book of Matthew in chapter 13 and verse 8 and verse 22, verse 23, it talks about the soils. And when the soil is broken up, then it is receptive for the seed. And it can be productive when the soil is broken. When tragedy happens, it will bring even the hard hearts and break their hearts and make them receptive to the soil. I had a fellow just recently, 
In fact, I was with him in South Carolina, and, and he was bitter against the things of God. He had a lot of things going on in his life, but yet this man was now, I sit at his table, and he begins to pray. What had happened, he said his uh, mother-in-law had passed away, and he said, this can even bring a strong man to his knees. And we could look in the Scripture, and you can find where those things that break people will bring them to a place where they become receptive. Some of you remember Jairus. Jairus had a 12-year-old daughter, and his 12-year-old daughter was nigh unto death, and that brought him to Jesus. Jesus, would you please, would you please come and see my daughter? At the same time, there was a woman who had an issue of blood for 18 years, and she's devastated, she's broken, and her only hope, she comes to Jesus, and Jesus healed that woman. We have Saul, the Saul of Tarsus, who we now know as the great the Apostle Paul. And Saul was having that internal brokenness and turmoil on the inside. The Spirit of God was convicting him. His life was miserable. He'd been there to advocate for the stoning of Stephen, and yet he met the Lord on the Damascus Road, and the Lord changed his life. We have to be broken. Uh, the Old West, how many you ever watch any of the Old West cowboy shows? You know, I like them. And you know, the, the whole, do you ever see the Buck and Broncos? They got to, you got to, you got to get on the horse. You know, got to, you know, the horse is no good until it's broken. So it is with us. We're not much use until we're broken. And so as I looked at and I saw, I missed so many opportunities in my ministry for many, many years. I literally missed opportunities. And there was one person I came up to within the last year, and I apologized for missing my opportunity. Here's a person. His father died from a tragic accident. He left the business behind that nobody knew how to run. He had a wife, and he had a very young child. He had a mother that was very dependent upon him. And I came back, and I saw him, and I was there for just a little bit. But throughout the years, I very seldom ever saw that person. And through those years, that person needed somebody to come alongside and help them. I missed those opportunities. I missed so many opportunities. I had opportunities to come, to show up, to be there, to do things. I missed opportunities. For had I responded to those opportunities, could have built a rapport, and some other positive things could have happened. Missed opportunities. Missed opportunities. I wouldn't say I was a stupid pastor. I was just ignorant, ignorant of what to do. And I dare say, and this is the burden of my heart, I'd say this is the same issue today. There's, there's, we're not stupid, but we're ignorant to what God says. And it's so simple, we missed it. I've sit and I've listened to different programs of 13 hours of instructions of this and 13 hours of instructions of this, how to come alongside, how to help. And those things are all very good. And then one day, in the, uh, the Lord gave to me, as he said, Nehemiah said in chapter 7 and verse 5, he said, God gave me an idea. God gave me an idea. And I was there and God gave me an idea in the early morning hours after I pondered on this. There's got to be a way to simplify all this stuff. And then God gave me an idea. And the idea was how to care. And it's summed up in the card that you have. God's 4-H club. God's 4-H club. And it's really rather simple. And it's these words. Hug. Hush. Help. And hang. Four rather simple words. First of all, hug. You know what a hug does? A hug says, I care without saying a word. And you know, you can give somebody a hug, one size fits all, and people don't mind if you exchange it. And there's some therapeutic value to a hug. When a hug lasts for more than 10 seconds, it brings healing to the soul, and it will bring tears to the eyes. And I mean a real hug. I'm not talking about this kind of hug like, you ever seen those kind of hugs? Yeah, you ever give those kind of hugs? Let's not go there. But, you know, but a real hug, I mean a real hug, the real hug, the hugs are therapeutic. I had, uh, you know, I want you to know, that in Luke chapter 4 and verse 40 is a reference, just one of many references, you find that most of the people that Jesus healed, most of the people that Jesus healed, he touched. 
He touched almost every single one that he healed. He's a touch. There's something to the touch that conveys care. When somebody comes up and they put their hand on your shoulder, Pastor, I appreciate you. That touch does something. And a hug is therapeutic. It has a healing to it. There's one of the men of our church, Ronnie Tripp. You remember Ronnie Tripp? His wife of many years had passed away, and he went down to the lower Gloucester, went to the town office, and he came into the town office, and one of the ladies that works behind the counter, she saw him, and she came out, and she says, I know what you need. And she got out from around the counter, and she walked over to where he was, and she gave him a great big hug, and tears came to his eyes, and he said, that was it. And he never forgot it. He remembers that, and he tells me that even to this day. We had a lady come into our church. She had lost her husband, and she was very broken, and she came in, and she didn't even know whether she wanted to be there or not. But my wife was very perceptive. She saw her. She went over, and she saw her, and she just gave her a great big hug. That's Pat Learned. And gave her a great big hug, brought tears to her eyes, and settled her soul. She said, that's it. A hug. There's a power to a hug. To hug. Now, I, I say this. You got to use a little wisdom. I mean, uh, you're a handsome young man. And you're in the mall. And you see this gorgeous young lady. And you run up to her and said, I think you need a hug. Nah, 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 not very smart. I mean, use some brains, okay? Yeah, a little bit of discretion. I say that because we live in a PC day. If somebody can take what you said and stretch it and take it out of, out of context. But you say somebody who is broken needs a hug. a hug. That's something simple to do. The second thing that is needed is hush. Hush. How many ever watched The Lone Ranger? Have you ever seen The Lone Ranger? Have you seen The Lone Ranger? How many have never, been it this way, how many have never seen The Lone Ranger? You've never seen the show The Lone Ranger, Darlene? Oh, my, you better go, well, go back and watch old TV or something. I, it's a, okay, The Lone Ranger, you know The Lone Ranger, you know, and Tonto, you know, and, and Trigger and all those things. Anyway, but he, he had the silver bullet. He had the silver bullet. And, you know, the silver bullet, and oftentimes I said, boy, I wished I had a silver bullet. Because if I had a silver bullet, I could fix every problem. There's a problem here. If I had a silver bullet, well, you know what? God gave to us two silver bullets. Every one of us here have two silver bullets. You know what they are? They're ears, and he hangs them on our head. And you know what? If we would take and apply these two silver bullets and just shut up and listen and let the other person speak, let them tell their story, let them tell their whole story, let them tell their whole story for just listen. Even Job's comforters were good comforters until they opened their mouth. Just listen. Just listen. Hush. Hush. I talked to a lady who is uh, affiliated with a motorcycle club. And she was, she was telling me when her husband died unexpectedly that she reflects back on it. And she says, you know, I so appreciate the people that just let me talk. And she said, I talked and I talked and I talked and I talked. And they just listened. Hush. Hush. I have email from people that some, one lady wasn't quite as... Uh, discreet in how she described things. She said something to the effect of, if you don't know what to say, just shut up. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. But just, just hush, hush, and let people talk. People want to talk. People want to talk about the person that they've missed. I uh, had a funeral for a baby. I never forgot that particular funeral, probably the first funeral I had for a baby. And I remember the mother, I remember the circumstances, I remember all that. About 12 years had passed. I'm at the funeral home. In comes this lady, and she's coming through the line, and I see her, and I talk to her, and I said, you know, I remember your baby. And she just, it was like hitting the download button. She talked and talked and talked. She wanted to talk about her baby. She wanted to talk about that person. I had a woman whose son had actually committed suicide. 
And I went through the, this was some years had gone by, and I was in the local grocery store, and I saw that woman, and I began to talk to her, and I mentioned something about that, and she just went on for 10 to 15 minutes in the grocery store talking about that person. There's an article I'd read about a woman who, who had heard that there was a uh, uh, kind of a grief care ministry for those people who had lost a child. And she is about 70 years old, and she shows up, and she says, is it all right if I come? And he said, well, well, sure, it'd be all right. He, you could come. He said, well, let me tell you my story. He says, about uh, 50 years ago, when I was about 20 years old, I had a baby. And my baby died. And my husband went, took care of everything, came back home, said, I don't ever want to hear anything about this baby ever again. Never mention it. Never say a word said, my husband just recently died. And I want you to know I had a baby. I had a boy. He has a name. And she just wanted to talk. She wanted to talk. I find people, if they tell me they said so-and-so passed away, I usually stop there and ask them about it. Because they usually want to talk about the person that they have that has passed away. People want to talk. And therefore, we need to listen. Listen, there's one lady, I've got an article here, one lady who says that she has a ministry <laughs> and that she just listens. Then she told one lady, she says, look, I'm here, and if you just want to scream, you want to scream, you call and scream. And sure enough, she said somebody called her up, and she said she was having, uh, lying on the floor, and she's having a terrible time. And she said, she, she said, well, what do you feel like doing? I feel like screaming. And she said, well, then go ahead and scream. She said, well, I can't do that. No, go ahead and scream. And she screamed for about 30 seconds, and then she said, thank you, and she hung up. I feel better. She just had to do it. You know, just listen. So two things, rather simple, hug, hush, and the third word is help, help. By help, I mean to be proactive. Help is not saying, uh, Darlene, if you need something, you call me. That's not help. That puts a burden on Darlene. Help is to be proactive. Help is to say, hey, you don't worry about the yard. I'm going to take care of your yard for you for the next month. Or help is to say, I happen to know that your husband was the one who took care of your finances. My wife and I were really good about that. We're willing to come alongside and help you out to help you work through this, to help you figure this out. One lady, actually there was a death of a, a, a the family had a death and the People were coming into the household, and this woman came in to her, the mother, and, and she gave her a great big hug, and then she disappeared for 20 minutes. And then she comes back, and she gives her another great big hug and whispers in her ear, said, don't worry about the bathroom, I just cleaned it up for you. And she laughed. And that woman said, oh, thank you. Now, men, we don't get that. I'm like... Hello, I invited, invited President Herbert Walker Bush to the house one time, wrote the letter and say, here, send a letter and invite him. We'll ne probably never come, but hey, he, he never come for sure if I don't invite him. So I sent an invita invitation to him. And the wife took it and said, no way. Why not? Because it'd be just my luck, he'll come. And then he'll be in my house. I said, what do you think they live in? You know, <laughs> he didn't come. <laughs> uh, but... You and I, fellas, it's not a big deal. But if we've got some, you ladies know what I'm saying, we got somebody coming to the house, oh, make sure you clean the bathroom. I'm like, oh, you know, it, but to this lady, that was real help. Help. I'm saying when you see that, be proactive. I know a person who lives up in northern Maine, her husband had died, and up there everybody burns wood. Her husband had died, it was a small church, and here it was facing the winter. And she had to go out and cut, split, and get her own wood and everything else. And nobody came to help her. And she was probably in her late 60s. It's like, hello. Proactive. Now, having said that, let me give another word of advice to this. Yes, we want to help. We want to help people in their time of transition not to take over. I say that transition, to help them transition to a period of time, and you're not taking over. Because I have seen some people sit back and expect, some people call them up a year later and said, hey, you said you would help, and I need my house roof today. Or whatever. There, there's a transition. Won't, don't take over. Use some good sense. So hug, hush, help, 
And then the last word here is hang. Hang. Hang means to maintain a presence. Now this is kind of simple. Almost every church and almost all of us have historically been like firemen. When the house is on fire, we're there. When the fire is all over, we're gone. And nobody's there. We're like firemen. When the death takes place, we're there for the funeral, the casseroles, the cards, the visits, calls, maybe there for a week, and then we disappear. We need to be like builders. And a builder is a person who maintains a presence, a person who will come alongside, a person who will call, a person who will, who will be there in the days to come. I know, uh, and when the Holy Spirit nudges us to make a phone call, we need to do just exactly that. For example, there was a person who had some business cards, you know, and he had this one card of a lady uh, family, you know, and his card fell all over the floor, and he picked that one up, and the Spirit said, call. So I thought, all right. So he called. And when he called the lady, she started to cry on the other end of the phone. And she said, I so much appreciate the fact you called because my husband died one year ago today. And I needed this. When the Holy Spirit nudges, you know, I could go on about, about that, but, but just to maintain a presence. Now, there are some material. And I laid out some material there in the back that's very beneficial in helping to do just exactly that. There is uh, uh, a booklet set of Stephen's ministry booklets. There is a thing there. Your church uh, knows about them now. And... Uh, and it's time that you give the first book like it's like medicine at three weeks where they should be emotionally in their recovery system or their processing. It's for three weeks. The next one is three months. The next one is six months. The next one is 11 months. And they're suited to maintain a presence. So take a personal note and stick in there and said, hey, Joan, I want you to know I haven't forgot about you. And I haven't forgot about your husband, Jack, either. Just hope that this helps. But maintain. There's that little booklet. There are other little booklets back there. There's booklets for that are inexpensive. Many of you have the daily bread. They don't cost but a contribution. You can get the daily bread. Well, they have what they call a discovery series. They have books there for dealing with suicide, deals with those who are left behind, just a, a, a spouse, or those who have lost a child. And I have one book back there that is very, very good. I don't get a thing from it. I want you to know I'm not promoting anything for money for me. I get nothing. These organizations pay me nothing, and I promote their stuff. I ought to tell them, say, hey, you guys ought to do something here. But no, uh, if there's good stuff. And uh, it's an excellent booklet for people who have a small child and somebody dies. It's interactive. You can take a look at it here afterwards, and you can look at that, and you can say, somebody I know who died was my grandma, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Excellent book. Very excellent book. There is some material there that helps us to do just exactly that. And in so doing, there is some benefit. And I have the testimony, and I won't take the time to share the testimony of this one particular family a family had two daughters. One of them died at the age of 28. The other one died at a tragic accident or had a terrible accident at the age of 26. And her response to this accident and these things, she said, one, she was amazed with the people that she didn't know that came alongside and provided help and the comfort. But she was also in awe by those individuals that she knew that were not there for whatever reason. They avoided her. And she said, at the conclusion, said, rather than assume that people need absence, assume just the opposite. They need presence. Maintain a presence. Now, having said that, I'm going to suggest that there are four things that happen when we apply the four H's, when we apply the hugs, the hush, the help, and hang. Maintaining a presence. Four things that will happen. First of all, it provides a, a positive influence for the church, for the community, and for the individual in the name of Christ. It is a positive influence in those respects. I know from my own, I have material here from a letter from a person I didn't know but in high school 50 years ago. He wrote and he talked about how much this stuff has really been of a help to him. My father had died and he always went to the same restaurant over and over and over and every day, every day. Always had the same thing. He walked in, they knew exactly what he wanted. And uh, he had died. About one year later, I was back in Illinois. I had to go to that restaurant. That's where he went. I had to go. So I go to the restaurant where my dad always went. And I sit there, and inside of me, and I understand this, and you would too, inside of me, I'm screaming, say, hey, don't you know my dad died? But they're going about their life, doing their own thing. But inside, I'm saying, don't you know he died? 
And then one of the waitresses came across the dining hall and came over to where I was and said, I remember your dad. I tell you what, that meant volumes to me. And it touched my heart. Now whenever I go back, I always look for that person because the positive impact of thinking that somebody remembered. Somebody said it this way, he who brings the water satisfies the thirst. And uh, that's one part. The second part, by doing these things, it'll build the body of Christ over time. Let me show you. I brought this up here for a purpose. Here's the hub. And if we focus in our ministry on the hub, and we do the care for this person here, this has lots of spokes. And it's figured out there's about 20 spokes to every family member who passed away. There's 20 of them. And if we focus on this and do this job right, the impact of that is much greater than we realize. And I hadn't planned this today, but we have a real testimony of that right here. About 30 years ago, God brought me into Darlene's life. And a part of coming into this life, you see the impact over years. And I didn't disappear. Never disappeared. There, there's, there's a bond here that, that I cannot put in words. I cannot put in words. It means too much. I would dare say that Bible-believing Baptist church, I'm going to guess a minimum of a third and maybe a half of the attendance that's there at that church was there because of this kind of ministry. And you know what? It doesn't bother me if they take the material <laughs> and help somebody out in Timbuktu. It's still the body of Christ. If it grows wherever it is to help. And I want you to think. Think of this. The pastor has limits as to how many people he can see. But this is a work for every individual within the church. Everyone can do this. You don't have to have a, th that's the next point. You don't have to have a theological degree to be able to do it. Believers, young and old, can do this. It's a work every one of us can do. And when your neighbor, somebody that nobody else knows, has this happen, and you can begin to pick up this ball in this ministry, and you can do that from right there and have a positive impact from your perspective where you are. You can reach. So here the pastor can reach these, and this one can reach this one, and this one, this one, and the impact over time. And I said it's over time. It's not like boom, and it always happens. Sometimes you may see that. But you know what? There's Darlene. And, and there's Jeff, and then Katie's not able to be here today, but then you see the children and Vivian and the others, and you see the impact. You see this one here, and, you, and you, the impact that they make. Where did that come from? That came from this ministry over time. Over time. You don't have to be old to do it. Young people can do this as well as anybody else. And here's the key. I mentioned the key before. Compassion. Some having compassion which makes the difference. You see, people don't care about how much we say we care until they first see how much we care. The poor guy who was on the side of the road when the, when the Samaritan came by, he didn't care how much those other guys said that they cared, but the guy who actually came and did something, that made a difference. When the Roman soldier demanded of the Jew that he had to carry his gear for one mile, when the Jewish guy said, let me carry it a second mile, then he'd say, how come you're carrying this a second mile? Well, let me tell you why I'm carrying it the second mile. I have a great God. People really care. And what I'm talking about is not bait and switch. It's not, it's not uh, hey, here's a candy bar. You can have that candy bar. Yes, yours. Now, would you please buy my wheel? Only cost $50. I gave you a candy bar. Come on. 
You know, it, it, what I'm talking about is not bait and switch. It's not that I'm going to do this in order to get another notch on my gospel belt. I'm going to do this to get John Doe saved. No, you do it because you care. You do it because you care. And when you really care, people see you really care. And if they see you really care, then people will respond to that. And the door of opportunity will open up. Plenty of opportunities. Now we know the ultimate caregiver is who? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then Jesus has said, but he proved his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? He died for us. He cared. Somebody asked, how much did Jesus care? Well, he put his arms out like that to say this is how much he cares. The ultimate caregiver is our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody asked, does Jesus care? The answer is, oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with our grief. And in the book of Luke in chapter 7 and verse 13, it talks about the woman whose son was dead. And she was a widow. And it says that Jesus came in with his disciples. They came into the gates of the city. And as they were coming into the gates of the city, they saw the funeral procession. And it says that Jesus was overwhelmed with compassion for them. For he saw this and he went and he healed the one who is dead. Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 says, Cast all your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Now, I have a heart that I carry. And I carry this heart here. And when I have a funeral service, I give these out. And the hearts are reminders about how that the high priest, first of all, the high priest had a stone on each shoulder. And on each of his shoulders represented the 12 tribes of Israel. He had 12 stones across his breastplate, the heart. So he would bear them up upon his shoulder. He would carry them upon his heart. So he'd bear them up and he'd carry them and he cares. And so I give this to individuals. I say at the time, one, they'll remember when they get it. I got this when my father passed away. Remember the person for whom it was given. So it always serves as a reminder of that. But I challenge people, please do remember the ultimate caregiver is the Lord and he's always there. He's always with you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never leave you. So I give this to people as a reminder, just as a reminder. Now, I gave everybody a card. Now, in the card here, it has here, it says, by the grace of God, I will be an active member of God's 4-H club. And I put that down, by the grace of God, because I can tell you I'm going to do something, but I, the only way I'm going to get it done is by God's grace. That means I'm not always going to be successful. But by His grace, I'm going to be an active member of God's 4-H club. And it has here the four things. Hug, hush, help, hang, the date, and your signature. And then uh, the other side of here gives your name, information, contact information. I would have, if you are led of the Lord to be an active part of God's 4-H club, because everybody can do this. If you would, then you could fill that out, tear this apart. Keep the hug, hush, help, and hang. Give me the other part. And then what I do with that, I put that on my own email and contact information. And on a regular basis, I communicate with everybody who is a part of that. And just to remind people, because if you're like me, and if you don't get a reminder, it'll just kind of drift away and be forgotten. So every so often I update people what's going on, what's happening, what's going on, and new information, and to, uh, just as a reminder. And to put that there, and one day, one day the bottom is going to drop out of somebody's life, and you need to be there. Because this principle applies more than to just a death of a loved one. This a applies to the principle of somebody's going through a traumatic experience in their life, and everybody's had those kinds. This is a, going to hard times, difficult things that happen. These principles apply to whatever they are good principles they apply. And now, this is something that we can do. We can do it. We're called to do it. It is our obligation to do it. Every age can do it. We have ample opportunity to come alongside of hurting people and do it. And we have the tools to help to do it. We can remember this. This is so important. Remember, we don't have to provide the answers or solve the problems. Just provide the listening ears and a caring heart. Isn't it liberating to know 
that we're called to be caregivers. He is the caregiver. I can't cure it. I can't fix it. But imagine if not only the pulpit was to do this, but every individual in the pew would do it. And I encourage the church to have the materials, supplies, resources available. The reason I say that is because if a tragedy happens to your neighbor or somebody you know, and then you say, oh, I need to get in touch with the Discovery Series. I need to get in touch with this. I need to get in touch with, I need, you know, many people say, I need to do these things. And the reality is, if I have to go do those things, chances are it stops there. But if the church body provides that there and said, hey, pastor, I just had a death of a loved one here. Do you have some of those resources available? And then you can go and get some of those resources. If money is the issue, you can make a contribution to offset the cost of the resources. But these are the tools that God has given to us to do the job. And we can do the job. It's ours to do. The question is asked, how do we get a compassionate heart? Colossians chapter 1 and verse 8. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul writes to the church of Colossae and he says, Epaphras has told me how that the Holy Spirit has used you to love others. So where did he get that? The Holy Spirit put the love in the heart for others. How do you get that? Well, on the back of your card, you see a turtle. The turtle is there for a reason. The turtle is inspirational. You see, a turtle cannot move forward without sticking its neck out. And I dare say, I didn't know the lady that I saw at Denny's the other day until I sat down and she came over and I began a conversation. And after talking to her for just a few moments, I began to care. I don't know the neighbor next door, but if I go over and say hi to the neighbor, I believe that the Holy Spirit will give me a caring heart for that person. What do you do? Stick your neck out. What do you do when it comes to compassion's calling? What do you do to help and be a part of God's 4-H club? Then stick your neck out and hug, hush, help, and hang. When we do this, we begin to be a positive influence for Christ. Build the body of Christ over time. Believers, young and old, can do it. Did you know young people die too? Did you know people in high school die? It is my hope, and you can pray about this. I know the superintendent of the schools in gray. And I have a good rapport with him. And I'm in hopes that the Lord will open the door that I'll be able to get into the school system in gray. Because they have to deal with grief. I've talked to him before. There's a possibility to get in there. I plan to go to Mexico and take the, I had to change the card, though. Uh, the, my my uh, interpreter in Mexico said, you know, I, I love what you have. I love the four H's. Only problem is four H's don't translate into Spanish, just four H's. So I said, well, work on it. See what you come up with. And he came up with God's A-list. And he has four words. As they all begin with A. I can't tell you what they are. I've got the card. I look at them. They don't mean anything to me. I can read this one. But we're going to be able to go by God's grace to Mexico to do that too. You see, I share this with you because I believe this with all my heart. I believe that every church body needs this. Because every body in the church can do this. And if we do this, we can make a difference. For Jude 22, some having compassion, making a difference. Jan Barker back there. I had the wonderful privilege getting to know her through the passing of her husband. She is a sweetheart. She's a sweetheart. Darlene Sturdivant. I cannot tell you how much I love her. And her family, and the memories, sitting at the table, and to see the benefits over time. God's for H Club. Pastor, you've got a wonderful church. I have never felt more welcome any place than I've felt here today. Great people, sweet people. 
I pray for you. Come on up. Have your way.